Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello, I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we'll be exploring the power of the near-death experience. This is part two of a two-part series. Part one was with Elizabeth Crone, and I'm linking to that right now in the upper right corner of your screen. If you'd like to watch that video first, you can use that hot link or check our program listings. My guest today is Professor Jeffrey Kripal, who is the J. Newton Razor Professor of Philosophy and Religious Thought and the former chair of the Department of Religious Studies at Rice University in Houston, Texas. He is the co-author with Elizabeth Crone of the book, Changed in a Flash, One Woman's Near-Death Experience and Why a Scholar Thinks It Empowers Us All. He is also co-author with Whitley Strieber of The Supernatural, A New Vision of the Unexplained. His other books include Authors of the Impossible, The Paranormal, and The Sacred. Mutants and Mystics, Science Fiction, Superhero Comics, and the Paranormal, Kali's Child, The Mystical and the Erotic in the Life and Teachings of Ramakrishna, and Secret Body, Erotic and Esoteric Currents in the History of Religion. Once again, this interview is being conducted on the Internet, so now I will switch over to the Internet channel. Welcome, Jeff. It's a pleasure to be with you once again. Yeah, happy to be here again. Thanks. Ha happy holidays to you. And, Thank you. Uh, you know, I thought it's very interesting in reading the book that you co-authored with Elizabeth Crone, uh, in which you sort of describe yourself as a dull fellow, that she's the one with all the... <laughs> <laughs> psychic stuff going on. Um, but I remember the interview we did not long ago on um, your other recent book, Secret Body, in, in which you made a point of talking about how powerful this writing is. In fact, in, even in this book, you make, you, you point out this is not an ordinary book that you're reading. Be prepared to be changed by reading this book. And my, my sense is that one of your, I would call it a quasi paranormal talent, at least, is, is that you are able to stimulate, um, exceptional experiences in people who read your books. Well, yeah, you know, okay, I, I, I think that's true. <laughs> yeah. I, I also think I'm dull and boring. So I think both things are true. Um, you know, I, I wrote this book called Authors of the Impossible, uh -huh. in which I basically argued that one way to look at paranormal phenomena as, is as if it was a kind of language or a text writing itself, uh -huh. and that there's something paranormal about particular kinds of writing. And that's why particular kinds of writing invoke or provoke these paranormal experiences, is that it's all, it's all connected around language and writing. So I, uh -huh. I actually agree with you on a very, very deep level, probably deeper than you or I can articulate at the moment. On the other hand, uh, you know, Carl Jung spoke of personality number one and number two, and number one was this rational ego um, bore, and number two was this wild you know, kind of unconscious mystic slash Gnostic slash heretic. And um, I can relate. I can very <laughs> much relate to that. I don't, I don't have access to number two like a lot of people do, but he comes out a lot and he comes out in my writing and I would be the first to acknowledge that. Well, it does seem to me very interesting that when you encountered Elizabeth, 
she uh, was a person brimming with psychic talent. She'd had this powerful experience uh, of visiting the afterlife, of being struck by lightning, of having precognitive dreams and seeing auras and instantly reading people at a psychic level. But she was so frustrated. She didn't know what to do with it. And you suggested to her, let's write a book together. I, I, she told me you suggested that. I, I think the first First time you met her, and uh, yeah, I, I did. I could mm -hmm. I could tell instantly that there was this incredible story in her, and you know, her reply to me, which she might have shared with you, is, "Well, I don't know how to write a book," and to which I replied, "But I do." <laughs> <laughs> so you know, I wasn't struck by lightning, and I don't dream the future, or at least like she does. Um, but she doesn't write books, so we kind of put our heads together and, and did this together. I also felt – I think I also felt on some level that uh, the book would be therapeutic to her. Yeah. Um, it would help her integrate these experiences into her social self, into her, her life in a way that she really wanted to do at that point. Um, and so I just – and I had just done one of these books with Willie Strieber. Yeah. So I knew, I knew how it worked, at least in that case. And I suspected I knew how it would work in this case. And so it was, to me, it was, uh, it was extremely satisfying to work with Willie. And I knew it would be really satisfying to work with Elizabeth. And both, both things turned out to be true. Mm -hmm. Well, I, of course, found her to be a delightful person. And, and we share, uh, not only do we share a common Jewish heritage, but we actually uh, share uh, family relationships that go directly to the Lubavitch uh, okay. tra wow. Hasidic tradition within, within Judaism. And, and my life was... Uh, really, my whole professional career was largely shaped by a, a, a dream I had when my great uncle, who was a you know, Lubavitcher Hasidim, although he kept it hidden when he died, it, you know, he appeared to me in a dream. So it was like the afterlife was calling out to both of us uh, through the lens of that Hasidic tradition. Wow, that's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, the more I talked to Elizabeth, the deeper the Hasidic and Kabbalistic thing. God, I mean, we fell down a Kabbalistic rabbit hole there, which which actually doesn't show up in the book mm -hmm. because it 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 was um, it was a rabbit hole. I didn't think um, the readers would uh, understand without any kind of training or historical knowledge. Um, but we did talk about it a lot, and we still talk about it. And it's mm -hmm. you're very much right about that. It's it's very much a, a family thing for her. It's even a genetic thing. Yeah. Um, there's something really remarkable going on there. I think there is. For example, uh, in my case, when my uncle, my great uncle Harry died, who was born originally in uh, Russia in, in a small village near the town of Lubavitch and was, uh, as a child, a student of the original Lubavitcher Rebbe, uh, Several of his family members, his, his descendants, had dreams, uh, uh, very powerful dreams about him at the time of his death. And, and the one that I had was in incredibly profound for me. I woke up singing and crying at the same time, which has only happened to me once in my entire life. This is why, you know, a lot of times in cultural or religious traditions, charisma or or religious uh, prodigies are passed on through family mm. lineages they they go from father to son or mother to son or mother to daughter i mean there is a kind of genetic wisdom there i think of course there's this beautiful picture in in the book and i'll i'll just show it now uh, briefly of one of her ancestors who was also uh, buried in the town of safad in israel which is known for kabbalistic teachers and uh, was associated i believe you wrote with isaac luria one of the great kabbalistic rabbis yeah isaac luria for those who maybe not are as familiar with the tradition, but he's often considered the most gifted mystic in all, the whole history of Judaism. I mean, he generated entire, entirely uh, original Kabbalistic system in the 16th uh, century. So he's not just another mystic or saint. He's like, 
he's like the saint or the mystic in this Kabbalistic lineage in some ways. And um, and she got a family member buried right next to him. I, mm-hmm. you know, again, that's I that's there's something there, and we didn't explore that in the book, but again, it's there. It is there, and I suppose it's uh, reasonable to to think that. Uh, even if you're a gifted mystic, you're going to have descendants who who have a variety of outlooks toward life, but somehow they they may all be touched in one way or another by the, uh, the essence of that mystical tradition. Right, right. And there's two, you know, we, you know, I'm just listening to myself blabber here. We, I think, we speak flippantly when we use the word genetic. Um, we don't, of course, really know how genes work. Um, the more we know, the less we know. Um, and of course, in Elizabeth's system, you know, the, the mechanism is reincarnation. It's not genetics. Uh, she writes and speaks explicitly and extensively about the soul reincarnating again and again. Um, and of course, often, I assume, within the same family or the same culture. So, there are different ways of understanding family here, too. Mm-hmm. I have talked to my Orthodox Jewish relatives about reincarnation, and uh, they tell me in, in their traditions, uh, and they are very Orthodox, uh, the reincarnation exists, but if you're Jewish, you will always be reincarnated into a Jewish family, uh, which is intriguing be- because I know researchers, uh, some researchers have specifically looked into this and find interesting cases where it doesn't work out that way at all. No, it does not always work out. You know, I I know the folks who study the, these court cases, children, children, uh, mm-hmm who remember previous lives. And one of the strong, strong findings of those that 60, 70 year research project now is that it doesn't follow any of the cultural paradigms. Yeah. Uh-huh. You, you can come up with all the karma theory you want and all the Hinduism or all the Orthodox Judaism you want, but it does what it does and it doesn't follow what we yeah. think it should do. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, yeah, that's, I think that's true. So, the subtitle of uh, your book, Changed in a Flash, is that uh, basically you're you're suggesting that Elizabeth's experience, which are very unique to her and her family, are really relevant to everybody. The second half of the book, which is the half I wrote, is the the central idea is that we are changing the afterlife. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think her experience is so relevant to to the rest of us is you know one of one of the things she comes back with is this notion that the afterlife will at least the immediate afterlife let's kind of be specific mm-hmm. will be different for everyone mm-hmm. you'll you'll see what you need to see and what you are prepared or conditioned to see but you're still encountering something very real on the other side and essentially what i try to argue in my half of the book is that Really, since 1975, when we began talking about these experiences, um, these these near-death experiences, as Raymond Moody coined it, to the extent these stories enter our culture and we talk about them like we're doing here, we're essentially setting ourselves and our ancestors, or I'm sorry, our descendants, we're setting our descendants up to have slightly or or, or significantly different kinds of mm-hmm. near-death experiences. Because one of the things we know historically is that these sorts of experiences change from period to period and from culture to culture. You can certainly find things that are similar, patterns or structures, but the content of them changes quite dramatically. And um, I think this is one of the messages Elizabeth brings back is that um, we we have some responsibility and and some capacity to to sort of reimagine ourselves, mm-hmm. um, and that's what that's why I think the book is much broader than her own experience or 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 her own Jewish. Uh, a tradition or set of traditions. Yeah. I, I know, um, prior to, uh, the publication of Moody's book, Life After Life, 
uh, it was almost axiomatic when people talk about death in the afterlife that nobody has ever come back to talk about it. <laughs> now, well, with near-death experience, we have thousands of cases where it seems as if people have come back to talk about it. Right, and of course, that was never true. Yeah. Uh, and and it displays a profound ethnocentrism because most of the world actually assumes reincarnation in which we've all died <laughs> many, many times, and we've yeah. come back many, many times. So it simply isn't the case. <coughs> sorry, Delilah. <coughs> no. Sorry, Jeffrey. It's okay. Uh, yeah, I have a young uh, blue healer who's trying to protect me here. <laughs> um. But it's an assumption. It's just an assumption that people make out of their own cultural conditioning that we, mm-hmm. we no one's ever come back. Yeah, I, I mean, especially when you consider that the whole uh, religion of Christianity is based on the idea that at least one person came back. <laughs> right. Yeah, but there is just one one <laughs> one rabbi. I mean, <laughs> at least in Asia, everybody comes back, you mm-hmm. know. But as you say, we are changing the afterlife by the narratives that that we create. That's what I'm suggesting. Yeah, and that we we not that you not that Jeffrey Mishlove or or, or Jeff Kripal or any individual can somehow will a new afterlife for everyone hereafter, but to the extent that we as a collective mm-hmm. engage in these conversations. And develop, frankly, new values and new beliefs. Um, the afterlife is changing, or the, at least the immediate afterlife, the one that people experience and then come back and, and, and tell. Um, you know, one flashpoint in that changing of the afterlife, and this was what made Ray Moody so controversial, as you probably know, is that there is no hell in life after life. You know, nobody in that book is judged for holding the wrong set of beliefs. You know, everybody in effect sees the light and has a positive experience. And this, this is what has made the near death literature so problematic for a lot of conservative uh, Christians in particular, mm. because they need people who don't believe X, Y, and Z to actually go to hell. That's, that's one of the um, requirements of their worldview. Um, and so there's been a lot of discussion about negative NDEs as well, which which there there are as well. Mm-hmm. But they don't they don't prove hell any more than a single NDE proves heaven. For a while, I had a psychotherapy practice back when I lived in California and was licensed in in California, and I dealt occasionally with people who had near death experiences and found that. Even the most positive near-death experiences can be very difficult for people to integrate, uh, yes. especially people who, who maybe they're living you know conventional lives, which often involve a, a certain amount of lying and deception and the sorts of business practices that are considered normal in our culture but wouldn't really stand up very well to spiritual scrutiny. Uh, once you've had a near-death experience, it's really hard to return to your your old lifestyle yeah the the most poignant case of that i've ever encountered was a a critical care nurse down here in houston and san antonio who worked with veterans military veterans who had had an nde usually in the battlefield you know they got their vehicle blown up or they were shot or something and they had an nde right there on the battlefield and came back just kind of in awe of this this beauty and this light, but also with the conviction that they couldn't kill anyone. And so it was a real problem. That's a real problem for the military. And the critical care nurse was trying to, you know, essentially work with both these these wounded veterans, but also with their military superiors, who of course often wanted to send them back into the battle. And their spiritual experience often conflicted just dramatically with what it was they were supposed to do as soldiers. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, there you just have a complete 
a complete contradiction. And frankly, you see the same. We do have a few really poignant cases of children who remember previous lives in evangelical or fundamentalist families who, again, can't integrate that experience into their worldview, but often end up doing so anyway, really out of love of the child. The love of the child ends up overcoming their their religious system. Mm-hmm. So I think I think I think there's all kinds of poignant uh, kind of conflicts that arise here. When you talk about changing the afterlife, it, it made me think about the ancient Greek mystery traditions. Actually, uh, we know very little about them, but one thing that is pretty well known is that uh, in ancient Athens, the leaders of the society all went through the uh, Eleusinian mysteries, and they came out, they were forbidden to talk about it, uh, but they would all say, I now know that uh, there's nothing to fear uh, with regard to death. They'd lost their fear of death as a result of going through the mysteries. It it does sound like something akin to the near-death experience. So the difference, though, there, there, Jeffrey, is we actually don't have a ritual system that we can take people through. Um, We, I mean, one of the things I play with in the book is whether, I mean, there are religious rituals. I'm thinking of like the, what is now called the Tibetan Book of the Dead, Mm -hmm. which was a, was actually very different in its origination, but is essentially a, a meditation manual um, for advanced meditators that is structured around essentially a death experience or a near-death experience or what looks like one. Um, and, of course, you mentioned the, the Greek mysteries also may have been structured around some kind of religious experience that we don't have access to because yeah. they, they kept the secret. Um, but we don't have that in this culture. We don't have a shared ritual that reenacts the death process and that prepares us for our own deaths. Um, other than this discussion we're having right now about <laughs> the death experience. I mean, I think that's yeah. the only public thing we have at the moment. Yeah. So I, it's, up, it's up to you, actually. As I recall, in the Middle Ages, there was something known as the art of dying, which was very popular. And I think it had a lot to do with confessing all your sins before you die. But uh, at least there was that. But in Catholicism, of course, there is a ritual uh, in which the dying person is anointed with oil and a set of prayers are said. Um, and it's, it's, a very, um, it's a very ancient practice, but... It's only for people who are actively dying. It's not something for healthy or living people to prepare for death. It's something for people who are actively dying. Mm-hmm. So we just, again, we just don't have that. We don't, we don't have that in our culture. I can imagine a time when uh, people who uh, are absorbing things like this video discussion and the books you're writing and all of the, the data that we now have about reincarnation and near-death experience and mediumship research, etc., will begin to create new cultural modalities for people because surely uh, preparation for the end of one's life uh, is, is much more important than uh, our culture normally uh, allows for. Again, we have nothing. We we think about retirement and moving to Florida or something. <laughs> you know, it's it's a pretty it's a pretty petty vision of the end of life. Yeah. Let's go to the beach and go to restaurants every day. That's sort of that's sort of our ultimate afterlife apparently. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm being facetious, but, but not that. I mean, there's, it's, it's unfortunately accurate, I think. Well, in in ancient Hindu culture, the idea was that once you've completed your responsibilities as a householder and and you're approaching the end of your life, uh, it's time to go and become a wandering ascetic and, uh, uh, begin to engage in the serious practice of yoga and meditation. Yeah. Again, that's a culture that institutionalized something, mm-hmm. something real and something important. 
Uh, but I've often thought that maybe it's also a way of uh, getting old people who can no longer contribute out of the house. You know, <laughs> you go wander in the forest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I'm, I don't know how I'm going to speak to that. Uh, well, I'm sure there, you know, cultures are mixed. There, there's no, <laughs> I don't know of any pure example of anything when it comes to culture. No, no. But, you know, at the end of the day, you know, if there, there are human universals and, and one of them is death. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, every culture has to do, deal, deal with it. Mm hmm. Uh, even if it deals with it by not dealing with it, we we have to treat it somehow. Yeah. And I, and I do think the near death literature is is healthy, and I do think it's a good step in the right direction. Although mm -hmm. I think it's often been naive, mm -hmm. you know, which is one one of the things I try to do in the book. Um, I think a, some of the near death literature is essentially an attempt to prove the the truths of particular traditions usually christianity mm -hmm. and and i think that's frankly naive mm -hmm. um i think people have christian near death experiences of course but but they also have jewish near death experiences and no doubt hindu and buddhist ones as well uh so i think that's the real fact mm -hmm. we have we have to struggle with in a in a in a, in a more profound way Mm -hmm. One of the most provocative ideas that I got out of your book was Whitley Strieber's comment to Elizabeth Crone when she kept asking, you know, what's the purpose? Why am I being given all of these precognitive dreams about airplane crashes, for example? And uh, Whitley said, well, perhaps uh, the purpose is for you to help guide the souls of those people who died in those uh, incidents. Right. Yeah. So that was, uh, I invited Whitley and, and Elizabeth to, to Eslin actually. It's been about, it's been a little over a year now, I think, when they were both there together. And, uh, it was extremely, um, confirming, I think, for both of them, particularly for Elizabeth, who at that point was still, you know, we were still writing the book and she was still essentially coming out of the closet. And she found, Whitley's guidance and mentorship, I think, extremely um, supportive and, mm -hmm. and helpful, uh, particularly around that issue, because she struggled her whole life with why she's having these precognitive dreams of tragedies that she can't stop or really help with. And his point, which which was really articulated in the form of a, a maybe or a suggestion, it yeah. wasn't a, a certainty, was, well, maybe you you can go back to that point in time and space and, and help them transition over. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, Elizabeth's, one of the convictions she came back from the other world with is that what we think of as linear time is largely an illusion. Um, and that actually the entire past, present, and future already exists right now in a kind of block universe, or as she likes to say, a, a big layered cake. Mm -hmm. Um, so if that's in fact true, then there's really nothing, I suppose, stopping one from moving around in that cake or moving around in that in that that block universe. You actually painted a very uh, detailed picture of what that block universe might be like with the uh, with a block universe, meaning that all time, past, present, and future exists uh, in this in the now moment, in in effect. And, and that human beings, we're like uh, strands of spaghetti as we move through time. And, uh, uh, you even go so far as to suggest that along that strand of spaghetti that represents us, there's signaling going on from the future to the past and vice versa. Right. So that's, I wish I could claim originality there, <laughs> Jeffrey, but that's, I'm really channeling Eric Wargo there. Yes. It sounds like he has a very sophisticated physical theory. Extremely. Um, he has a book called Time Loops, mm. um, which really articulates all of these ideas in a very elegant and, and really beautiful way. And one that's in deep conversation with the sciences, particularly neuroscience and physics. <laughs> Um, so this idea of a glass block universe is not original to Eric or me. It's it's really something that cosmologists and physicists um, 
uh, play around with all the time. It's it's mm. one it's one it's one cosmological model in play at the moment. I understand it goes back to Einstein. Yeah, it actually goes back to one of his students named Minkowski. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, but yeah, ultimately to Einstein. But but Eric picks it up to to make sense of a precognition. Uh, which is the phenomenon he's most interested in thinking about. And, uh, he, uh, he really, for me anyway, makes good sense of a lot of these precognitive moments. Um, and essentially what Eric says is, is that, that you and I and, and the brain exist in these three dimensions right now. I mean, I can see you, you can see me in three dimensions, but we're also spread out in this fourth dimension of time from our conception to our death. And that's that spaghetti worm that you were referring to. So we, we mistake ourselves as three dimensional objects when we're in fact four dimensional, uh, uh, what, what Eric calls tesseracts. The, mm-hmm. the brain for him is a kind of four dimensional tesseract spread over an entire lifetime. And, and information can pass both directions mm-hmm. along that tesseract. And this is what precognition is for him, is the brain essentially precognizing itself uh, just down the space-time. Mm-hmm. So if, if we look at this cosmological picture, which would be consistent with Elizabeth's experiences, it it really suggests that uh, at, at this very now moment, we uh, ha- have lived and died many, many times. Mm-hmm. It all comes down to how big is your now, mm-hmm. right? Is it just this or is it this or is it the whole universe, you know? Yeah. And if you live in a glass block universe, the, the ultimate now is is the whole shebang. Mm-hmm. It's not just this little moment that you and I are caught in because of the way our brains work. And the implication of, of that, whether or not the cosmology proves out to be correct, the larger uh, message I should think for every uh, reader and every viewer is is that we uh, are so close uh, to having a much much larger vision of of reality. We don't need to limit ourselves to our average day to day ego bound experiences. No, and and my point, you know, I, I I make this point in the book, but I've made it in a lot of other places. My point is not that you should listen to Jeff Kripal about what the proper cosmology is or what physics is. That That is not my point mm-hmm. because it shouldn't. You should not. Yeah. You're um, not a physicist. Right. And if, and if I claim to be one, you should turn off the computer right away. <laughs> my point is much more humble but also much more radical, and it's that – if you could imagine living in such a glass block universe, then what was what was before that impossible, like precognition, suddenly becomes not only possible but to- entirely plausible. Mm-hmm. So, what's possible or impossible in your worldview depends entirely on the worldview in which you live. Yeah, it has nothing to do with reality. Reality is almost certainly way weirder and way stranger than you think it is. And if you live in a world in which we're caught in this linear arrow of time, well, then, of course, precognition can't happen. But if we live in a glass block universe like the cosmologist suggests, then actually it can. Mm-hmm. And and so that's my point. Mm-hmm. It's, it, you know, I, I write about making the impossible possible. And what I mean by that is how reality shifts for us when we take on a different understanding of the universe or a different understanding of what a human being is. One of the other concepts that Elizabeth came back with after her near-death experiences is, is the idea of uh, the the dual nature of the soul. The, yeah. Uh, one way to think of it, I suppose, is that we all have a, a, a higher self or a spirit guide, and that spirit guide may appear to us as, as an external entity, but it's really part of ourselves. Right. This, of course, is an ancient, ancient idea. Mm-hmm. This notion of the spiritual twin or the angel as a twin or the doppelganger to, mm-hmm. to kind of shift into a more modern German context. 
Um, you know, and I've written about it in the sense of the humanist too. You know, this notion mm-hmm. that there's actually two of us and probably more, but mm-hmm. but this conscious ego that we're in is clearly not all that we are. And so for Elizabeth, there's always this other angelic self that is guiding us through life and that we encounter when we die. And then we we reincarnate again and again until we learn what the lessons we need to learn. And then we ourselves become a twin or an angel to someone else. Um, And to me, this is just, it's, it's a kind of a mythical way of saying we are everybody else. You know, we, we, all of these things that we imagine as, as religious entities other than us are really us. Mm -hmm. And, and we all share in each other's lives. We actually become one another. As we as we reincarnate over and over and over again, uh, and I have I think that's pretty that's a profound that's a profound world to live in, mm-hmm. you know. And I think it would change fundamentally how we think and what we value and how we organize our societies. It sounds as if what you're saying at this point echoes what Larry Dossey wrote about in his book One Mind. And again, that's that's a that's an ancient and very traditional message, at least of the mystical currents within these traditions. It's, it's not, it's sort of pure heresy in terms of the, the sort of public, uh, orthodox traditions, but it's extremely common claim Mm -hmm. within the mystical traditions. I'm also very puzzled by something Elizabeth, uh, said that when she first entered into this heavenly garden, uh, shortly after being electrocuted, she heard a, a voice and it was just sort of near her. She never looked at it and it was her grandfather's voice. It had a distinct French accent, but she said she knew it wasn't really her grandfather at all. She said it was God speaking to her in a voice that wouldn't frighten her, that, that she would be comfortable with. But then later, I think, you know, within just a few months or a few years of her experience, uh, she received a telephone call from the same deceased grandfather. And this time she said, I know it was really him. Same voice, but he had a message and it was very personal and about her mother, his daughter, and sharing a message with, with the mother. She had a lengthy conversation with the grandfather. So the same voice was uh, at one moment, the voice of God, and at another moment, definitely the voice of a, a deceased grandfather calling her on the telephone. Right. So, what, what's the question? Jeff? <laughs> well, there's so, there's so many absurdities in in in, in, in all of this. Uh, you are confronted as a scholar with accepting her story. And you talk about uh, that you entered into this relationship with her based on trust. Because on the face of it, parts of it are uh, absurd from a rationalist perspective. Right. I I think, well, the whole story is impossible from a, from a rational or or at least materialistic perspective. Mm -hmm. But again, you know, I think embedded, this is what struck me about Elizabeth's story early on was that, you know, there is this narrative of, of kind of belief and, and, and the sort of the literal truth of what she encountered. On the other hand, Elizabeth says over and over again that I saw what I needed to see and I heard what I needed to hear. She's very aware that these are not what I would call pure experiences, that they're being they're being filtered through her own imagination, her own psyche, her own religious tradition. Mm-hmm. So, and I think that's what she meant when she said it was my grandfather's voice, but I, I knew it wasn't my grandfather. She was trying to articulate this notion that she was encountering the divine, but not directly, mm-hmm. which of course you can't do in Judaism, Jeffrey, you know that yeah. you and this is why I think also she didn't see. She refused to turn around. You can't see God. Mm-hmm. You know, that's 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 rule number one in the Jewish tradition. You that's can't, right. You, you can't see God. So it makes complete sense to me that 
she would never look around and she would never see anyone, but that she would hear God. That's, of yeah. course, very Jewish, too. Yes. You know, and you're in a garden. Very Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, none of that bothers me because it, it it's how – it's how a sacred experience or, or a near-death experience would, in fact, what you would expect it to look like if it were fed through a Jewish filter or a mm -hmm. Jewish culture. Um, in terms of the phone call, you know, I, I'm just thinking out loud here, but my guess is, is that she would make a distinction there because the, the content of the call was so mundane. You know, and it had it only had to do with what her historical grandfather would have known. There wasn't any metaphysical or religious import to it. You know, so I think the content of the two yeah. conversations was just so radically different. Mm -hmm. But also, she recognizes that the phone call was in some sense imagined as well. Like, if, I, I pushed her on this point. I mean, okay. it's in the book. I said, Elizabeth. What would a, what would have your husband have heard if you would have handed the phone to him? And she was very quick and immediate. She said, "All he would have heard is a buzzing." Oh. You know, I I understood that what I was hearing was meant for me, and that anybody else would have just heard static or a buzzing. Okay, well, I think that's significant. Yeah, you know. Um, I don't doubt that the phone rang and that something was on the phone, but I think she, in effect, was the translator. And I think her her own psyche, her own imagination was translating whatever it is she was hearing. Um, and she heard her grandfather's voice as her grandfather's voice, not as God this time, because the conversation was completely banal. Uh, and had nothing to do with any religious truths. I, I thought that it was an interesting conversation for several reasons. Uh, the, he had a message he, he wanted her to pass on to her mother, and she said to him, well, you could call her directly. I'll give you the phone number. <laughs> and, and he said, no, she wouldn't be able to hear me. You can hear me because you've already been where I am. Right, and you've been struck by lightning. Yeah. You know, you've essentially been blown open, mm -hmm. and uh, the rest of them can't hear me. Um, so to me, that's significant, too, you know, because it, it confirms for me this notion of what we call the filter thesis, that the body and the brain are not actually producing consciousness. They're sort of actually keeping it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, we're more of a filter than we are a, a producer, or to put it differently – we're much more like an antenna than we are a computer. Mm -hmm. we're, we are not generating this. We are receiving this, and we're reducing it, and we're translating it into a kind of 3D movie that we're, we're starring in. But actually, it's, it's, not, it's not all coming from inside here. And I think that's what's happening with this phone call from the dead and, and frankly, what's also happening with the near-death experience. And that's why trauma – it's so common mm -hmm. in these experiences. You have to you have to blow open or break open that filter for this other stuff mm -hmm. to get in. And I think that's why Elizabeth was so paranormally gifted after the lightning strike, but not before it. Although she had been sexually abused as a child, and there's a lot of literature now showing that people who report spontaneous psychic experiences also tend to report childhood trauma and sexual abuse. Right, and I, I've i thought that was related from day one. Mm -hmm. I mean, my first, my first book on this Hindu Saint Ramakrishna deals with sexual trauma in his early life and its relationship to his later mystical ecstasies and visions. And I argued there, as, as I argued in this book with Elizabeth, that those two things are not unrelated. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that the trauma produces the vision or the near-death experience. It means the trauma breaks open the person who then comes back together, but later in life, has some kind of spiritual experience which relies on that earlier breaking open. Mm -hmm. They essentially learn a skill yeah. to survive the horrible trauma they experienced early in life 
And that same skill then becomes crucial to their ability to have and survive the later spiritual mm-hmm. experience. Yeah. Now, I'd like to come back to the telephone call for a moment. Uh, I don't think I've shared this with you, but one of my distant cousins, a Jewish distant cousin, uh, Scott Rogo, wrote the original book, Phone Calls from the Dead. And no, I didn't, I didn't know that. I didn't yeah. know you were. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, now in England, uh, Callum Cooper, a, a researcher, uh, has has revised that book and updated it. It's now called Telephone Calls from the Dead in his edition. And he, he's got about 50 cases. And, and there are, uh, amongst those cases, instances in which the phone was passed around. And oh, okay. different people spoke to the deceased person. I think in those cases, nobody knew that that they were dead at the time uh but it does seem as as if uh you know there's something very tangible going on there i listen i i i, I know those things happen i mean elizabeth's is the second or third phone call from the dead story that i've been told by mm-hmm. by individuals who were deeply, deeply impacted by mm-hmm. these experiences. These were not casual conversations at dinner parties. These were, in one case, it was a woman who drove hundreds and hundreds of miles out of her way just just to spend an hour with me to tell me this story. And all she really wanted was uh, a human ear and a sympathetic another human being to hear her mm-hmm. and not to call her crazy. Yeah. Uh, and this was a, this was a heartbreaking story. And uh, I had absolutely no doubt that it was true. I mean, she, she, and I had no reason not to believe her. And she never wrote about it. Never. I mean, there's no, there's no motivation here yeah. uh, other than just human, human, human kindness and wanting to be, Wanting, wanting to be part of a community in some sense, you know. So I, I find these stories heartrending. I, you know, the, Jeffrey, the the way I I define the paranormal is is pretty simple, but I think it works beautifully here. A, a paranormal event is one in which there is a subjective state in the experiencer that corresponds somehow eerily to a physical event in the environment. So if you remove the physical event, it's not a paranormal experience for me. But if you remove the subjective experience, of course, it isn't either. You have to have both of those together. Mm -hmm. And these phone calls from the dead are dramatic instances of that where (laughs) they just explode our notion of what what's possible. Right. 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 We when we think of. When we think of religious experiences, I, I think all of us assume, oh, these are entirely subjective things that go on in someone's head. They're like hallucinations. Well, <laughs> when the when the damn phone rings and it's a dead person, <laughs> that really screws up. Yeah. That mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Um, and that's why I think they're so powerful. Mm-hmm. They, they, they just mess with us yeah. in really dramatic ways. Yeah, I actually had such an experience myself. A phone, a phone call now? Well, it, it's similar, oh, very, yeah. very close to the classical experience. Uh, it was three in the morning. The phone rang. Uh, I was dreaming at the time, and I was dreaming that I was having a conversation with a dear friend of mine who was deceased. Uh, you may know Elizabeth Targ, Russell Targ's uh, daughter. Oops. Was sure. a, a, a beautiful woman. I knew her since she was a teenager, and she died at the age of forty as a geoblastoma uh, brain tumor. And at the time, she was conducting research on healing and uh, with a population of people suffering from brain tumors. And uh, she's a very talented researcher. And after her death. There were many um, examples of of her communications through mediums and in other ways. And I had this dream, and she was speaking to me in a dream. And I said, Elizabeth, how wonderful to hear from you. I have heard all about your communications, and I'm so impressed, especially the physical ones, because there were examples of that that I knew of. And at that very moment, the phone rang and woke me up. I picked up the receiver because I had a phone next to my bed in those days. And 
it was just white noise yeah. on the other end of the phone. Yeah, see, that's what Elizabeth said anybody yeah. would hear in her case, you know. Mm-hmm. That's very interesting. Uh, uh, and her grandfather told her that uh, how difficult it is for someone on his side of the spirit world to try this form of communication. He said it can only last a brief period of time. I, again, I <laughs> these things just awe me, you know. Yeah. I, 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 I don't know what else to say. Um, yeah. Well, the fact that we can just talk about it in a matter-of-fact manner like this, and of course we're sharing it now on the internet, means that it be- our, our discussion becomes part of the overall conversation, and I think it creates a, a, a little bit more safety and a little bit more context for other people who are having these experiences. Uh- yeah, I mean, that's what I meant. You know, the subtitle of the book, again, is One Woman's Near-Death Experience and Why a Scholar Thinks It Empowers Us All. And mm-hmm. that's what I meant by yeah. empower. Yeah. You know, uh, I meant to create a safe space and mm-hmm. just talk about these things. And, you know, Elizabeth, as I'm sure she told you, she waited 30 years to tell her yeah. story. Yeah. She was so afraid of being shamed and her, particularly her children being made fun of because of their, you know, their strange mother. So she, the social, the social sensor is so powerful and it, it, it represses these stories. And so we then think, Oh, these are rare kind of anecdotal tangential stuff that we don't really need to think about. No. These are as common as human beings are. They happen every day, every minute, all over the world. And the only reason we don't realize that is because of this social sensor that's like pushing, keeping them all down. It's a taboo of some sort that uh, is implicit. We're afraid of our own super natures, essentially. Yeah. And, um, and so we imagine they're rare and unusual and weird when actually they're us. We're That's who we really are. That's what we're really capable of. And I suspect that virtually everybody, including people who are uh, extreme skeptics, all have somewhere in their lives some kind of a hidden talent. Yeah, or in their family. Mm-hmm. I mean, <laughs> the truth is some of us are so dull and so thick <laughs> There's actually none of this in our whole life. (laughs) And that's what the filter thesis, by the way, would predict, right? Sometimes the filter is super thick. Mm -hmm. So any really sophisticated model we want to play with here, it has to explain two things. It has to explain why people have these experiences so often, but it also has to explain why some people don't. Mm -hmm. And we have to have as much compassion and as much sympathy For those people to whom it never happens, as we do to those like Elizabeth, to whom it is happening all the time. And I think once we arrive at such a model, um, you know, I think it'll stick, you know, Mm -hmm. it it won't be right either, by the way, it won't, it won't work everywhere, but at least it'll, it'll get us going. Yeah. Well, Jeffrey Kripal, once again, this is a delightful conversation. I'm so happy to be able to share this with our viewers. And, and I look forward to having many more conversations with you, uh, because I, I think we're doing a very important service to the world at large just by talking about these things. I hope so. Well, you are, Jeffrey. I'm, <laughs> you're the one doing this. I'm just blabbing in my library. You're the one doing the show. I I have a almost a compulsion to keep these conversations going. At the at the moment, I'm cranking out three a week. But <laughs> that's, that's that's amazing, actually. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my thank you. no, thank you. It's really a, a pleasure and an honor to be with you. Okay, likewise, and we'll do it again. Okay. Bye. Bye for now. Bye.